grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. We're in this series uh, called Reclaim, 50 Days of Transformation, and we've talked about um, our, our health and physical health, life in community, we talked about our spiritual health, and last week we, we got into mental health, and we talked about how God reclaims our minds and wants to transform the way we think, and we had a fellow by the name of Steve Miller who grew up in this church who experienced tremendous mental illness and came and talked to us about how God has reclaimed his life in the midst of that as he's uh, been able to get on right medications and how faith was a part of that. And, and he's going all around the United States speaking about mental health and getting support groups going, talking about God reclaiming a mind. That was awesome. And this week, I think uh, you're going to walk away feeling... Um, God's power in the midst of our emotional health as well. We want to talk about, last week we talked about how, how God um, transforms our mind. Today, uh, what's in our hearts and how to deal with how you feel. Uh, listen to this passage of Scripture from Mark chapter 12. Uh, Jesus said this, The most important commandment is this, You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind and all your strength. You hear the emotions in those words of Jesus? Uh, Jesus is saying God wants an emotional relationship with you. He doesn't just say here a head knowledge. Yeah, I know who Jesus is. I know God, blah, 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 blah. Instead, it's God wants an emotional, passionate relationship that is full of feelings. And so today I want to share, start off by sharing some key truths as we get into this that'll kind of get us revved up. And the first of those is that, and you can follow along in the back of your bulletin. Actually, I think that's the only way you'll make sense of this message today, by the way, uh, is that first, God has emotions. God is an emotional God. We hear in Scripture that God is actually jealous for us. That's an emotion that God loves you. He's compassionate for you. He rejoices over you. Scripture says that God feels joy, grief, pain. He has hatred towards sin. He has frustration with his people Israel sometimes. He's had that throughout the Bible. God has emotions. Um, the reason that you feel emotions is because you've been created in God's image, which brings us to point number two there. My emotions are a gift from God. God's emotional and it created you that way. It may not always seem that your emotions are a gift from God, but even the negative ones have a role in your life. Emotions are a great asset they actually give us a window into our soul, into to what we're dealing with, the state of your being, what you're struggling with, uh, what you're happy about. Emotions, uh, without them, you would just be a robot. God created you to have an emotional ability, and, and it's actually through your emotional ability that you can be loyal to someone, that you can love others, that you can be creative, that you can be kind and generous. Emotions do all of that for you. Genesis 1.26 is one of the most profound verses in the Bible where it says, Then God said, let us make humankind in our image. If we're emotional, then we know that God is also emotional because we have emotions. The, um, the reason you were made in God's image is because God wanted you to experience a love with Him. Well, the third key truth here at the beginning is that there, there are two stream, extremes to avoid in your life. One is, is called emotionalism and the other is stoicism. Emotionalism would say that uh, the only thing that matters is how I feel. It doesn't matter what I think. It doesn't matter what's right or wrong, what's popular or unpopular, good or bad. Um, this really shows that I'm controlled by my emotions, that I I'm, do, do what I feel is right. Do what I, I feel is good. If it makes you feel good, do it, right? That's the old say, saying. So emotions control, they dominate, they run my life. Well, that's one side. The other extreme is stoicism. Stoicism says that emotions aren't important at all, that only your will, your, what you think, your, your volition, your intelligence, your intellect, those are the only things that matter. Feelings don't matter at all. And it's it's really a funny thing because Stoics often marry emotional people, and emotional people often, often marry Stoics. And uh, usually in a marriage, you have one who's a stuffer, like a Stoic, stuffs it down, and the other who's a gusher, like an emotional person. And um, stuffers are uh, often frustrated with gushers because they're too emotional. 
They're always uh, uh, just the opposite of Stoics who are, uh, 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 gushers get mad at Stoics because, you know, they, they just stuff everything down. They don't share anything. They don't tell what's going on inside of them. Well, those are the two extremes. And it's really a happy medium where you want to be because God really intended the mind and the emotions to work together hand in hand. That one isn't dominated by, by the other, but that they inform each other. And when they're in, in check and when they're uh, held together, that they can actually be an incredible asset for us. Uh, what's funny is, is that there are also entire Christian denominations built, I think, on these two extremes. Maybe you've... Um, Seen people who say, well, it's only the truth of God's word that's important. And, you know, uh, to have right theology and to say things the right way and to do this ritual this way, that's the only way to do things. Um, you know, well, I, I think there's a warning in Scripture about how people honor God with their lips but don't worship Him with their hearts. The Bible actually doesn't use the word emotion very much, but it talks about hearts and passion, uh, that kind of affection for God. And so emotionalism, being emotional is a, is a part of worship. For God, God wants us to worship with our heart, the Bible says. But the other side of it is, is you, you, feel, you see people who all they want to come to church and get an emotional experience. You know, they, they want an ocean of emotion. They want to have a quiver in their liver. They, uh, they, only, uh, they feel like if they haven't been enraptured in worship, they haven't really worshipped at all. And that's not right either. That's using, they're seeking an emotional experience and not really seeking God, which is idolatry as well. And so God's design is, is for us that both emotions and our volition, our, our mind, our will, and our hearts and our passion go together. So I want to talk today about how God reclaims our emotions. And there are three key points I want to share with you today. And again, you back your bulletin, you can follow along, but God reclaims my emotions as, first of all, I recognize my feelings. And what I'd like you to do is right beside this point, to write down, uh, name it. Because you can't really manage a vague feeling. Um, you have to be specific. At our information centers today, I'm, I'm leaving their uh, vocabulary of feelings. And if you'd like to pick one of these up on the way out at the uh, information centers. Uh, when I was... Um, First going to some counseling years and years and years ago, uh, the, uh, the counselor said to me, well, you're, you're kind of an emotional guy. And I said, you bet I am. <laughs> and I said, uh, she, I, you know, anything wrong with that? Nothing wrong with that. Uh, except for that, uh, can you name any of your feelings? Can you name any of your emotions? I said, sure. She said, well, they one. And I said, okay, happy. She said, okay, name another one. Sad. Okay, can you name any more? Um, well, um, I don't know. And so uh, she said, you know, it's going to be very important as you go along in life to be able to, to name your emotions, to identify the feelings. Because once you identify and understand the feeling, you now can process it. You can understand it. And so today I want you, if you're interested, to pick one of these up at our information centers. On the back side of it is conflict resolution, which we'll actually be talking about next Sunday when we talk about relationships and how God's design is for us to reclaim our relational life. But the first step of that is even to recognize our own emotions and be able to, to process them. Um, the book of Psalms is really a book all about emotions. It's really uh, a gift to us. Uh, the Psalms have feelings both negative and positive, you know, good, good and bad emotions. And so when you read the book of Psalms, you might hear this in Psalm 42, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? The psalmist writes, probably David. I remember a time in college when I was quite down. Some things were happening in my life that I didn't have control over. And, and someone suggested that I read through the book of Psalms. And so I did. Um, you know, they said, you know, maybe, maybe read one or two a day or five or ten or, you know, wherever your heart takes you. So I did. Every night before I would go to bed, I would just open the book of Psalms and I would read. And I would then pick it up the next night where I had left off before. And it was one of the most powerful emotional experiences in terms of my spiritual life that I ever had. I would encourage you to think about doing it to get in touch with your, your emotions and maybe even to begin to recognize what your own emotions are. Uh, my dad used to read five psalms every day. So there's 150 psalms. In 30 days, he would read through the, 
the book of Psalms, and he would start over the next month. He would just read through the Psalms just 12 times a year, and he did that for years. What a great opportunity to take to God all of our emotions and say, here, God, uh, I'm just like the psalmist who is angry at this or frustrated with this or happy about this or excited about this. Um, God's desire is for us to bring our emotions to him. There's a song on the radio that I love right now, and I don't know if you listen to 101.9 or 104.1 or 89.1. They're all great stations here in town. And uh, the song uh, by Casting Crowns called Oh My Soul. It's based on this psalm that I just quoted here, Psalm 42, because the, the, um, uh, the author of the psalm, Rick, Rick Hall, who is the, the lead of Casting Crowns, uh, he was going through kidney cancer. And, and he is, as he was writing this song, he, he just was feeling the experience of, oh, my soul, you're, why, why are you down? Uh, and, and the song goes on to say, you're not alone. God is with you in the midst of your emotions. So let me give you three questions to ask yourself in relationship to your emotions. Number one, what's the reason for your feeling? Uh, There was likely something that triggered the emotion. Feelings can lead us, by the way, to be manipulated. And so uh, if your feelings overwhelm you so that you ignore the truth or that you ignore your commitments or that you ignore what's right, that means you're falling for whatever you feel. Advertisers, of course, love this, right? Because if you'll buy on what you feel, you'll do an impulse buy and you'll buy exactly what they want and perhaps put yourself in financial difficulty. Listen to Psalm 25. I love this in the New American Bible. Like an open city with no defenses is the person with no check on their feelings. What's the reason for the feeling? Why are you feeling the way you do? Secondly, is it true? There are things that we feel about ourselves or others that don't match up with reality. They don't match up with, um, with what, what we're actually experiencing in the world. And by the way, uh, the feeling, I feel you're stupid. I like to tell this to couples all the time. I feel you're stupid. That's not a feeling. That's a thought, by the way. <laughs> I feel you're stupid. You can't say, I feel you're stupid. No. Um, feelings are often unreliable. Um, Sometimes you have feelings about yourself that are flat dead wrong. I'm unworthy. I'm not beautiful. I'm not smart. Well, God created you perfectly. And sometimes our feelings let us down. God made you in his image. Is it true? So what's the reason for the feeling? Is it true? Thirdly, is it helping or hurting me? If it's hurting me, then I need, I need to process the feeling with someone who can help me deal with that feeling and be able to move through it. Your old nature knows your moods, and and wants to whip you around with your feelings. Listen to what the Bible says in Romans 8. To be controlled by human nature results in death. To be controlled by the Spirit results in life and peace. So the first part of God reclaiming your emotions is to name your emotions, to recognize what it is that you're feeling. And then secondly, is to, God reclaims my emotions as I accept my feelings with grace. You can write down beside this one, claim it. So I name it, but I also have to claim it as my own. Uh, The psalm says this, Thank you, God, for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. God made you with all of your thoughts and all of your feelings. And so your feelings are neither right or wrong. They just are. Every day you experience hundreds of emotions. Right now, you may be experiencing an emotion of boredom, and that's completely understandable. And you might also be experiencing a feeling of feeling trapped. When will this guy ever stop talking? That's completely understandable. Give yourself some grace in understanding your feelings. You may have feelings of of joy that you've gotten a raise at work, or you may have a, a feeling of fear of losing your job might have a feeling of excitement of the football game coming up. All of those are legitimate feelings. They aren't bad or good. They just are. They actually reveal what's going on inside of our heart. Uh, After we recognize the feeling, as we talked about in the first point, we have to accept the fears, the inadequacy, the... the, um, Uh, the guilt, the hurts and pains that we feel in our life. And once we accept those, that we have those feelings, now we can get to the point where we can process them together. So what actually happens is, and you can write this down in your paper, 
Anger is a secondary emotion. Let me say it again. Anger is the second emotion that you feel. When you're angry, you're angry because of another feeling. Um, You might be angry because you're disappointed or frustrated or confused. And so it's like the warning light going off on your car. Get the engine checked. You wouldn't ignore that, right? So when you're angry... You shouldn't ignore the fact that there's something churning inside of you underneath the surface that needs to be dealt with. Get it in and get it checked. Talk to someone. Have an opportunity to process it. When Marlis and I have a quote-unquote disagreement at times, then uh, it's always, it always goes back to a feeling. One of us has said or done something that has caused the other person to have Uh, a hurt or a disappointment or a feeling of inadequacy or or failure. And those feelings then start to result in a conflict. It's when we are able to hear what the feeling is below the surface that we're restored in our relationship with each other. When we accept the other's feeling, we are more than halfway to resolving the conflict. When we don't accept our feelings or the other person's feelings, we wind up stuffing it down. And later we'll become passive aggressive or we might get depressed or we'll have blow ups and all sorts of uh, dysfunction that results. And so we have to name it, but we also have to claim the emotion, accept that these are emotions and feelings that I have so that I can get somewhere in processing with others. The third is to frame it, name it, claim it, and frame it. God uh, reclaims my emotions as I reflect on my feelings with hope. God wants me to have hope in the midst of my feelings. Uh, God made us emotional, and so it's only through the Holy Spirit that we can even understand our feelings. Listen to Scripture. When the Holy Spirit controls our lives, He'll produce this kind of fruit in us. Love, joy, peace. Boy, just stop right there. I'd love to have those three all the time, right? Love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I have to ask myself if the emotions I'm feeling are going to make me more Christ-like or if they're going to go the other direction. And if they're not making me feel more Christ-like, then it's time for me to process those with someone who can help me to, to start looking at what would it mean to turn these into, into God's, in, into God's uh, reflection. Philippians 2.5 says this, have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had well, it's only th- through discerning what is of God and what's not, what's of, of God and what's broken in me that I can begin to really reflect God's glory in my life. And that happens when I pray. It happens when I'm in God's Word. It happens when I'm talking with another Christian about my life's emotions. And then it's not just about ragging on someone. Framing it means it's not just about ragging on someone, but it's about remembering that that person is also a child of God, is loved by God and that they deserve the same grace that I need in my life. And then as you know, we feel those hurts and pains, as, as we reframe them, that God can do something with them by His Spirit, only His Holy Spirit can change the way we feel. Only His power can transform our emotions. Two years ago, this December, a good friend of Morris and mine um, experience one of the most difficult seasons of life that an individual can experience. Uh, Marlis and I have been journeying with Joan DeHeis since her daughter committed suicide um, in December of 2015. Um, I want you to hear of the tremendous sorrow that she's faced, but also I want you to hear the testimony of God's presence that has allowed her to reframe her child Hannah's life and death and how God is reclaiming her in, the, in her emotional life today. Take a look at this. I have um, been coming to St. Mark's since 2005. I've been helping with Alpha, both here at church and the prison ministry, which is pretty amazing. Um, I've been to the first mission trip in Haiti. Very eye-opening and very just loving and full of joy. Just an amazing trip. In our small group, it's just been so amazing and heartwarming because we can sit and talk one-on-one about anything that's going on in our life. Um, The good things, the bad things, um, just how 
family oriented that feels, especially when you are here by yourself. You have that connection with people. You have connection with people that have the same faith. Even though you'll be on different paths, you are still in the room and you're sharing and you're talking. Hannah was diagnosed um, with anorexia and bulimia back in 2005. She also battled major anxiety, depression, and bipolar. And in her struggles, she lost that battle. And on December 15th of 2015, she took her own life. And within that battle comes the colored hair and the tattoos and the piercings. A lot of times people use those as ways to express themselves because they don't feel like they fit into this world. And it took me a very long time to learn that lesson. She taught me so much through her mental health, just the being kind and compassion to anybody, anywhere, because you just don't know what they're fighting is so important. And I feel in today's society, we're lacking in that and we need to do that more and more. During Hannah's treatment, one of her things that she was taught to do was to journal. Uh, medications are an important part of the treatment for mental health, but also is journaling and using those life skills. A lot of times we weren't able to read those journals, but when she did pass away, we went through some other things. And what disturbed me was the, the idea that she wasn't loved, or that she wasn't pretty enough or that she wasn't good enough to fit in today's society. Pages over and over and over again of saying, I'm unlovable, I'm unlovable, I'm unlovable, or I'm a burden. Pages and pages of this. We played a song called, I Will Trust In You, at Hannah's visitation and at her celebration of life. That says it all. I will trust in you when you don't move the mountains because there are going to be times in our life he will not move those mountains but we need to trust him that he has a plan and he is going to do what is the best for us. It's all through his word. A lot of times I couldn't remember scripture but I would remember. I love you. I sent my son to die for you. He rose, and you're all gonna to be together again. None of these things we have done, but it's a gift of God. And those things are the ones that just brought me from the depths of sadness and grief. And that's what God wants you to do. He wants you to take all of your pain and tears to him so he can help you work through this. And I just feel that it's so important that as is today's society, we don't need to shoo our feelings aside or our emotions. We actually have to face them. I have a sticky note here in my hand also that Hannah wrote that says, I loved you at your darkest, see Romans 5.8. And Romans 5.8 states, God demonstrates his love for us because while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that is so important. We did not do anything to deserve eternal life. This is a gift. This is a gift. He's loved all of us. We're all, all sinners. And even how she passed away, that first took a whole new meaning to me. Because grace, if I as a parent can't say, I love you, Hannah, still, how would a God be able to say to me, with all my sin, Joan, I still love you still? My journey with God right now is I used to plan big and say I had to do all these things, but I've learned after this that it's the kindness, it's the love, it's the small things that you do every day just to build somebody else up. That's what we're here for. You can do grand things, Right now, I can only do small things, but those small things become bigger things. And that's how God uses you. He hopefully has used my pain and Hannah's pain to bring awareness to mental health and to suicide, but to what love is all about. 
I cannot, in my own words, tell people how important it is that the only reason I'm here is because of God, because of His strength and because of His love. Because when you lose a child, you lose a part of yourself. But it's that love and that bond between the two of you and between your faith of God and what He has promised and what you trust and what you hope in that really has a whole new meaning to me. Well, so um, we've been on that journey with Joan and uh, her Facebook posts are just some of the most amazing reflections of, of love because she's immersed herself into God's presence in the midst of her pain and in the midst of her emotions. She's, she's named it, of course. She, she, she's claimed it because she, uh, she understands that this is what you go through when you're suffering and hurting. But she also has seen it from God's point of view, framed it in the way that she uh, reflects on it with hope. And so as a part of my uh, devotion this week uh, in this book that's uh, the companion to Jesus, um, Jesus um, Calling, this is Jesus Lives, and it's God speaking to you as you read it. And I, I love this uh, because it says from 2 Corinthians 3.18, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord, who is, is the Spirit. And then it says this, There's no veil between your face and mine. As you gaze upon my radiant perfection, you are being transformed into my likeness. I understand your weakness and the fierceness of the battles you face. I rejoice in your desires to c contemplate me and reflect my glory. Having planted that longing in your heart, I, I want to see it flourish. Take time. Take time with me. Refuse to be discouraged by distractions and the fickleness of your mind. Simply return your focus to me whenever you realize it is, it is wondered. And as you wait persistently in my presence, ask the Spirit to help you. Little by little, He will conform you to my likeness. You will be unaware. You may be unaware of these changes because self-forgetfulness grows through focusing on me. But increasingly, my glory will, ref will reflect from you, pointing others towards me. I think that's a picture of Joan. I pray it's a picture of you as you recognize the struggles that you might have and the feelings that come with it and that you're able to, to process those in a way that's able to, to see your emotions as God-given, helping you to recognize when you're hurting, when you're in pain, and go and share that, talk about it, open up and and. and reflect on, on God's love and what God wants to do with what you're dealing with so that you might reflect His glory. Let's close in prayer. Lord God, thank you for the gift of emotions and, and the way you've created us. Uh, sometimes I feel I'm a little crazy that way, oh God, and I, 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 I'm thankful for that. And I pray, oh Lord, that you would uh, use these things uh, to, to give glory to yourself in this world. And pray for each person in here today that um, they might get in touch with their emotions, understand them, and be able, uh, God, to, uh, in hope, frame them uh, through your love and grace. Use us for your glory, Jesus. Uh, reclaim our emotional life, our hearts, as we place them before you and in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.